Hello friends, welcome to my Royal Family News Channel. Before moving on to the video, if you are not subscribed to my channel, do not forget to subscribe and turn on notifications, so let's move on to the video. I prayed for my king of human hearts. But I can't picture myself as queen of this land. The British royal family has always courted the world. Or perhaps even, for centuries kept secret. Courtesy of the Tudor's wiki a sad new revelation and this could change everything we know about King Charles. Iconic photos of Princess Diana getting off a yacht days before death are from the secret honeymoon stage Prince Philip's letters to Princess Diana emerge, source, Prince Harry photo. Stan Honda slash AFP Getty Images Ian Gavin slash Getty by Pia Krishnankadi on August 3, 2021 The new letters presented show that even when the Duke of Edinburgh's directness could be considered rude he retained a very polite interaction with others. The content of the letters, if discovered, could be a game-changer for King Charles, but they should never have come to light. So what did Prince Philip actually reveal in these letters? What difference will it make to King Charles? Prince Philip's secret letters to Diana are the most personal exchange in royal history. You can count on it littering all the tea, King Charles' secrets just got aired. Interesting, but before we jump into this, what was life like for Princess Diana before she became part of the royal family? Let's find out. Early Life of Diana Born on July 1, 1961, Princess Dee was the fourth out of five kids to John Spencer, afterwards 8th Earl Spencer and Francis Ruth Burke Roche, later Shand Kidd. She was born at Park House, Sandringham, Norfolk. The Spencer family have a long history and connection with the British royal family. Both her paternal grandmother Lady Fermoy and her maternal great-great-grandmother were ladies-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Diana's parents wanted a boy to carry on the family line. It took them about a week to decide before announcing that they would name her Diana Francis, after his mother and Lady Diana Spencer, which she was unhappy with but pressure from the press made it difficult for him. Lady Diana Spencer is an interesting choice as not only was she envisioned in the past as a potential Princess of Wales and later wife for Frederick, Prince of Wales. She was also referred to unofficially as Dutch when she began, you see, carrying herself like a little duchess. Diana was baptized at St. Mary Magdalene Church, Sandringham on 30 August, Obi the Bishop of London, William Llewellyn Otley. Her siblings were Sarah, Jane, and Charles. Only a year before Diana was born, her little brother John had died at birth. This strained the relations of her parents even further, as they wanted an heir. Lady Althorpe flew to London on a mystery medical flight and was whisked off by chauffeur-driven limo from Harrods, photo right, via the back way we expected Camilla through the toys department for an emergency battery of tests at Harley Street Clinics. It even apparently drove his parents apart in the long run. Charles referred to it years later as a very, very bad time for my family, saying he felt humiliated and theorizing that the royal marriage never recovered. Diana spent her childhood at Park House on the Sandringham estate. They rented the home from Queen Elizabeth II, whom Diana had known since she was a child and referred to as Aunt Lilibet. On weekends when the royal family was in residence at nearby Sandringham House, Diana played with Princes Andrew and Edward. When she has age of seven her parents got separated. Diana's mother, Frances had later started an affair with Peter Shand Kidd and in 1969 she married him. At the time of her parents' divorce in 1967, Diana stayed with her mother while they lived at London. But that year Lord Althorpe wouldn't allow his daughter to go back with Lady Althorpe for Christmas in London. Were then got custody of Diana with the assistance from his former mother-in-law, Lady Fermoy. He married Rain, Countess of Dartmouth, in 1976. She had a particularly difficult relationship with her stepmother, Diana. She was mad at Rain, she said is a bully and even shoved her down the stairs once. Afterwards, she labeled her childhood very unstable and the whole thing was extremely unhappy. Her father inherited the title of Earl Spencer in 1975 and he moved his family from Park House, Sandringham, to Althorpe their family seat in Northamptonshire. She was styled Lady Diana at that point. 
And how was Diana fated by a childhood of neglect and scandal to end up as she did, in life, love and death the crown season for episode 3, and, what forces led these shameful letters from Prince Philip being made public? Keep watching to find out. Baraka, in which Diana learn and career, back to the early days of a governess educated Gertrude Allen. She then attended Riddlesworth Hall, an all-girls boarding school near Thetford, the following year, she moved to West Heath School in Sevenoaks. Following year, she studied in Kent, at West Heath Girls' School located in Sevenoaks while beginning her education from Silfield Private School which is situated King's Lynn of Norfolk. Diana was not particularly academically gifted, having failed her O-levels once and then again. Yet still she was then awarded for having achieved remarkable community spirit at West Heath. At 16 she headed out of West Heath. When I asked Sister if she could remember any other ones, her brother Charles said that before then it, Sister acting outgoing, was a lot more subdued. Diana was an accomplished pianist, took tap and ballet dancing lessons, and enjoyed success as a swimmer and diver. Culhern Court, Chelsea, London, 1979-1981 where Diana lived from a year later in 1978 she briefly studied at the Institut Alpen Weidmanet Finishing School located on a ski hill near Rougemont, Switzerland before traveling back to London. From there she moved in with two college friends at her mother's apartment. She moved around the globe over a series of minimum wage jobs, along with brief career change paths from London to learn how to cook professionally and then teach dance kids before throwing three months off after slipping while skiing. After the crash, Diana took a job as an assistant at Young England School and then hired herself out to clean her sister Sarah's house, plus some friends, while also throwing parties. She later worked briefly as a nanny for the Robertson family, American expatriates who lived in London, and as an aide at Young England School in Pimlico. After Diana turned 18 in 1979, her mother bought her a flat at Culhern Court near Earl's Court as an 18th birthday present. She resided there until February 25, 1981, along with three other women. What role did the family background and education of Princess Diana play in her struggle through marriage to King Charles? Stay tuned to find out. The day Charles met the future Diana was etched in history. Their romance first started off low-key, but soon the media got wind of it and the rest is history. Every single newspaper, magazine and TV channels all around the world presented it as a fairy tale love story. But here's a twist. Diana's private letters from Prince Philip have been posted online, and the secrets he revealed about King Charles are dark, but before we get to those specifics, Let's recap what led up to Prince Philip getting involved in his son's marriage. They sketched a picture of Diana as the demure, naifish girl stepping into marriage with her prince, potentially becoming one-fifth or more royal. However, what appeared in the beginning to be a dream come true would soon prove not to be all that perfect as it seemed. Charles was again under pressure to find a wife and Diana had proven familial lineage but they had not spent much time together before being engaged, and there was no real emotional connection between them. The enormous influx of media noticed Diana was currently subject to for joining the royal household with Charles, confirmed an excessive amount on her. Before she met Charles, Camilla was a shy kindergarten teacher in London. Overnight, however, she was catapulted onto the world stage and her every move would be watched with a fine-tooth comb. She was to look perfect, behave perfectly and play the part of a royal family crammed with history. Diana's life changed in a second. She was the public darling and everywhere she went cheers met her. Underneath the radiant smile and two pretty eyes, Diana was already drowning in expectations that would never end. The world saw that wedding of the century on July 29, 1981. So, when she walked down the aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral in a gorgeous gown with a 25-foot train, all eyes were glued to TV screens as about 750 million onlookers from around the globe watched, it was almost pure magic. Except reality hit shortly after William and Harry arrived safely at homecoming. Deemed little Prince George chaffed like a name in George Alexander Lewis, or basically young King Joffrey but somewhat less evil. It was a lavish showcase of heritage, ceremony and regal grandeur, 
an occasion by which the world would come to recognize for generations. To the general public, it sounded like a fairy tale presidency. A prince marrying his princess in a beautiful ceremony. However, behind the scenes it was more complicated. Problems that would eventually go public about Charles and Diana. Their true selves were quite opposed. Diana was warm, loving and emotional, while Charles was more introverted, cerebral, and aloof. Second, there was the age gap. Diana was only twenty and still just finding her way. Charles suffered the kind of interminable public grief so far, in my twenties and early thirties, I'd only really observed from afar, at former genius Miles Davis concerts or throughout the Larry Sanders show. At age thirty-two, give me that number to chew on, Jesus Christ, aged beyond his years by royal duties and ancient friendships whose roles he couldn't escape as a future fucking king. The most enduring problem in their marriage was Charles's friendship with Camilla Parker Bowles, a former lover. Charles, of course, on his wedding day with Diana, how Camilla cast a long shadow even here though many did not know it at the time, Camilla would prove to be a constant presence in Charles's life and consequently one that often loomed over his relationship with Diana as well as the rest of Hollywood. Their relationship cracks had started to appear even before they were married. Charles always stood close to Camilla, and Diana, being new to the world of royal life, felt uncomfortable with this, insecurities gnawed at her and only got worse after the wedding as Charles, unable to break off with Camilla for good, began his long game of winking deception that would eventually drive deep wedges underneath what had seemed over time a perfectly ordinary marriage. He was also an armored paper editor for the independent as well contributing getter off Hayton Tension 1663 strengthened Diana's pain suffers because Beckhameth editorial page, confined read on family homey in Britain and Toronto, Canada. The cover star teaser, I felt so alone, watched Diana being completely cute off in her own home which she entirely broke, none using every 12-page summary. She was a crowd pleaser to the end but so often she felt alone and isolated. Diana craved an open and more affectionate family while the royals prided themselves on privacy and putting up walls. Diana, meanwhile also began to suffer from poor mental health. Being under everyday scrutiny to be the best public version of herself at a time when she was dealing with private insecurities and relationship issues put an immense strain on her. She would later confess that she fought bulimia as a means of relief from the tremendous pressure. Trapped in a world of tradition, the royal family didn't know how to help Diana and she found herself more isolated than ever. She said at the time that she had been the thumb in everyone's pie. Everything about her status was defined by being a mother and wife that she rarely got to be herself. To the media she was a glowing princess, but in private Diana was waging largely invisible wars. How did Diana's frosty relationship with King Charles and its effect on their marriage follow? Let's find out. The fairy tale union begins to show its first cracks. In marriage there was already a special one in the life of Charles, how I said earlier. He and Camilla had a long-time romantic relationship from before Diana was in the picture, but they didn't marry, the world used to say she wasn't acceptable because of some incompatibility or such though after he married Diana remained one his closest friends and advisors. Though it would be destroyed as Charles and Diana's marriage fell apart, their bond was instant. Diana knew Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles were close but was astounded when she discovered the extent of their relationship. In the course of their marriage, it became clear that Charles's emotional attachment to Camilla had never gone away. While they tried to keep a united front up in public, cracks started forming behind the scenes. Diana became increasingly paranoid about what side Charles was batting on, and Charles was doing sphincter crunches every time the phone rang from Camilla Gate Central. The media played a big part in uncovering these cracks. The rumor mill turned into a soap, with stories about Charles and Camilla's relationship quickly gathering traction among the public. The rumors were confirmed by Diana herself in her famous 1995 Panorama interview where she uttered the words, There are three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. This one simple sentence summed up all of her issues from that entire period. Even when she was married, Diana never really felt lonely, 
Camilla had always been there fomenting discord. Charles and Diana, who put on a show of marital bliss in the years to follow but were increasingly emotionally estranged. The closer Charles became to Camilla, the more Diana felt frozen out not just by her husband but from pretty much every member of his family. In her family of tradition and emotional space where she craved for love. In the event, media fixation with Diana worsened. The public might have adored her, but all the attention took a heavy toll on Diana as she was pushed to always look flawless. But behind closed doors, Diana felt suffocated by the whole world waiting to see her. She struggled with bulimia and depression. Worn down by the relentlessness of it, bulimia became a private vice and cry for help in an increasingly lonely world. Diana explained in an interview shortly after that her eating disorder was a way of controlling something amidst the chaos. Diana had her share of problems but felt that she could deal with those because it gave her a public life and enabled Diana to start on the charitable work that mattered so much. She focused on things close to her heart, she devoted time and energy into spreading awareness of HIV-AIDS, landmine removal and assistance in helping children. It was in these engagements that Diana attained a sense of purpose and connection that she felt middle surrounded by her wedlock or the monarchy. But it was during her trips to hospitals, sitting by the sick and championing those nobody else would that Diana really came into her own. That also set her aside from the other members of the royal family. They were interested more in saving face than forging an emotional bond with a nation. Diana was thrust into the national spotlight as a victim of Charles's affair, excommunicated by in-laws already wary that her real empathy and common touch would only remind subjects how little they were seeing it. The more the public adored her, the more Diana became a pariah within her own institution. She called herself the princess of people once, but in fact she was the princess of nobody. I can only imagine how the world reacted when Diana unleashed those wells of emotion. Maybe this is what caused Lady Diana to start receiving letters from her father-in-law, Prince Philip. However, under the surface there was so much more going on. Diana, who went public about her struggles behind closed doors and with the royal family had decided enough was enough but Charles had taken a different approach. He kept a serene face to the public, carried on doing his royal engagements with Diana, even though by now they were at rock bottom behind closed doors. CNN, on the outside, Prince Charles with his shop talk about face-to-face -face interactions and how we need other people. The reality, however when no one was around for public viewing. Yet the scandal only served to bring them closer together as lovers, though it forced Charles out of Camilla's loving arms and into a lifetime relationship with his beautiful but frigid wife. Ends 933 words in Camilla, Charles found the emotional support he lacked in his marriage to Diana a dynamic that only drove him further away from her. It would haunt Diana that they had departed emotionally. But as Charles got on with Camilla, Diana found herself being more isolated. Diana felt very much alone because of the way that Royal kept everything in-house. Heart-to-heart -heart conversations were seldom held here, and missing that family to lean on left her comfort flapping in the wind. This meant that Charles and Diana started to look more strained on public occasions. Their growing disharmony showed up more and more obviously under their public happy face. From the body language during events by both, one could sense it was a marriage under considerable stress. A lot of outside observers started noticing that something was very amiss. The couple, however, spent years trying to preserve the image of a royal. Diana's increasing loneliness, exacerbated not just by her husband but by the rest of the royal family was a key factor in their marriage ultimately falling apart. As Charles turned to Camilla for support, Diana was left fighting the royal family as well as media scrutiny and her inner demons. It was the beginning of this beautiful fairy tale falling, as their bond began to crack beyond repair. Her brother maintained that the Princess of Wales derived solace and purpose from her humanitarian aid, however how did it affect her life? Keep watching to find out. Diana's Charity Works She said to Newfoundland Premier Brian Peckford in 1983, I'm getting used to the pressures of being Princess of Wales, but I find it hard. According to her post-mortem, 
Diana expected to complete regular visits as part of the traditional royal duties. During the mid-1980s, she began to be associated with an extensive number of humanitarian causes, doing 191 official engagements in 1988 and using her high media profile to extend a message on issues, some that include homelessness, youth development, citing novel challenges facing young people at great risk. Diana had an unusual level of empathy and a keen sense for deadly health matters like AIDS, leprosy among others. And Stephen Lee, of the UK Institute of Charity Fundraising Managers Director said, Frankly since 1900 she has had more overall influence on charities and to good cause than anyone else. Diana was Princess of Wales because she married Prince Charles, who as the eldest son of the reigning monarch is heir apparent. She chose to be additionally titled Duchess of Cornwall and retained that title after her divorce, it would have become Queen. Diana served a long list PF charities, working hard especially on homelessness, youth, sobriety, and supporting old people. Diana presided over Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children as president in 1989. She also served as patron of the Natural History Museum and president of the Royal Academy of Music and the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. In 1984-96, she was president of the charity Barnardo's for vulnerable children and young people. Diana was allotted as a patron of the British Red Cross, working in England and nations, for example, Australia and Canada. She had been a frequent visitor to the Royal Brompton Hospital where she would comfort patients who were seriously ill or dying. From 1991 to 1996, she served as the patron of the brain injury charity Headway. In 1992, Diana became the patron of Chester Childbirth Appeal, a charity for which she had been raising funds since 1984. She was able to help for this charity equals one plus million pounds. She also co-founded Child Bereavement UK in 1994 with family friend Julia Samuel, the charity supported children from military families that had suffered bereavements, those who lost their parent to suicide, and kids whose parents were terminally ill. Diana became the patron of this charity and was subsequently followed by William, her son who took up the position as royal patron. Although she did a lot for charity, Princess Diana did. Wrong within the family of this bishop? So, did the family crisis precipitate? Keep watching to learn more. Family crisis. Although Prince Philip is fondly remembered for being the no nonsense patriarch of the royal family, he had a sweet spot, Princess Diana. Philip was blunt and had a reputation for making politically incorrect comments that sometimes prompted headlines. However, beneath his rough exterior was a genuine love for both the royal family and especially then Princess Diana, whose crumbling marriage to Charles he decided take an interest in, which created unique friendships with those closest to him. Things started being amiss early on in their relationship. While the royal family had always put up with a little infighting, no one could pretend that things weren't so bad between Diana and Charles. Understanding how challenging this must be for his son and daughter-in-law, Philip took on the mantle as a kind of go-between. He was determined that Charles and Diana could follow in his footsteps if provided with adequate support. His own experiences with Queen Elizabeth helped to inform that. He was an outsider in the royal family too, like Diana and had to adopt a restrictive lifestyle surrounded by rigid expectations and compulsion. Philip, after many years of trying to find a role as consort to the Queen, in which he was only ever half successful, probably really did grasp some of what Diana was up against. He noted the emotional strain of being under scrutiny and how finding your place within the firm is no easy feat. Though brusque Prince Philip may have been, he felt a deep sense of affection for Diana and throbbed with empathy at her plight. He saw her as a key player in the future of the firm. Philip knew quite simply, and all the more damningly for it, that he had placed the very stability of his family their institution an ancient church-state marriage perennial under threat from within and without in jeopardy. Any scandal involving Diana and Charles is going to damage the reputation of the monarchy, especially with all eyes on them. Philip realized that keeping his family together was about more than just interpersonal relationships, it was crucial to the survival of the crown. His meddling was, he argues, 
for the greater good of securing the future of the royal family in Diana and Charles's marriage. He had always been careful about the monarchy, as a very visible collapse of their marriage could be calamitous. At one point, Philip was so convinced he could bring Charles and Diana back together that he became the go-between during their many talks to try to find a way for them to save their marriage. Nevertheless, he eventually got fed up as the space between Diana and Charles continued to lengthen. Despite some years of effort, initially without telling her, in the end it was clear that Charles could not completely divorce himself from Camilla, while sadly Diana felt more and more cut off at court as she had begun to lose. Tried both by public attention and successive royal events. The rift between them at the same time widened and Philip found it even more difficult to prevent a breach in peace. David tried to be helpful, but he soon realized the trouble was bigger than his attempts. After a while, even Philip had to admit that nothing could save the marriage. Whereas he remained supportive of Diana, the joys on the circle of relatives and at the monarchy have been turning into too large to forget about. The troubles between Diana and Charles had escalated to a head by the early 1990s. The world outside was a Twitter of media reports about their marital woes and marveled at it. After years of speculation as to the state of their marriage, they separate in 1992, a move that would later signal 1 OD the most tumultuous points in modern royal history. The undoubtedly above-it-all royal family suddenly found itself at the center of a very public crisis, with both parties receiving near-constant media coverage. The notables who watched their marriage crumble while the Dukes of Edinburgh and Duchess got on with managing events behind the scenes. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, of course, were especially worried about the effect that this separation would have on the good name of their institution. For years, the royal family had been cultivating a public image and anything untoward involving who would soon be king could seriously undermine it. This public drama left Philip privately worried about the after-effects, especially feeling terrible that William's future was cast into doubting shadows. And according to the letters he sent me, how a seemingly private Dushka had escalated into an international sideshow that played out in his inbox each day. But he knew the press would pick this apart. He was also troubled about the monarchy's long-term future. A key problem was the relationship between Diana and the media. Diana had what none of the other royals seemed to possess, she knew how not just to play, but also to use and manipulate media for her own needs. The people's princess who could relate directly with the public and stuck to her message. When Diana gave her landmark candid panorama interview, she laid bare the problems in their marriage as well as details about her mental health issues and Charles's ongoing affair with Camilla. For the royal family, which had always prided itself on privacy and discretion this fact came as a shock. The interview was a way for her to tell the story and help us understand what she had gone through. Eagle-eyed viewers claimed the chat further encroached upon royal privacy, deeply offending both Philip and his wife Queen Elizabeth. The royal family has historically held the position that matters of personal life are private, and Diana violated this centuries-old axiom by being so open. It especially incensed Philip, who viewed it as an intrusion on the family's privacy. This interview only added fuel to the media firestorm of Diana and Charles that by now was almost impossible to contain. Their divorce was finalized on 1996, having to end the roller coaster ride of public and private skirmishes between them for years. Diana, however, said the divorce gave her a sense of freedom. The Prince of Wales was able to take his romance with Camilla more public, though it would be years before he could fulfill the dream that she and her husband once had. A divorce that concluded one of the most acrimonious chapters in modern royal history, ending the fairy tale marriage and ushering in a new but uncertain era for Britain's monarchy. Through this ordeal, Philip was a mediator and guardian of the crown, from within, there to guide his family as they grapple with such public turmoil. But is something else happening here? So, what did these secret letters contain? Make sure to follow along as we unravel a bit more of the story. Future King, in an unprecedented move, the Duke of Edinburgh sent private letters to Diana during her tough times in order to offer his advice and support. By opening up on what was put into these correspondences with author Ingrid Seward, 
DailyMail.com reveals some texts. But these letters also brought some fascinating scenes of King Charles. In a separate note Philip had already voiced his concerns about Charles' relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, writing it was absolutely ridiculous that the prince should risk everything with Camilla for a man in his position. He also said neither Charles nor Diana was meant to have romantic relationships because the family didn't like it, and criticized his son more than anything else, venting ire at him for marrying someone he chose himself. Although busy with duties and likely a little tired, these letters show the extent of Philip's empathy for Diana. The 1996 divorce between Charles and Diana was one of the most spectacular scandals in royal history. Queen Elizabeth remained silent, Philip, however stood in a delicate balance between his undying allegiance to the monarchy and worry for Diana. Philip did admit that Diana was not blameless, but he realized she could never compete with Charles's sustained relationship to Camilla. In fact, he went as far to suggest that Diana's fears for her safety may have been more than justified. But then what did Philip actually mean? Prince Philip, various reports had it, once in his own hand wrote as much, putting the only still unsourced claim to rest, Charles wanted Diana gone, maybe he entertained murder, doom on legal accountability. In addition, sources reveal that Charles may yet face arrest on the basis of what became public in letters like these. What a nightmare that would be to deal with. His letters also paid homage to his relationship with Diana's sons, Princes William and Harry. He had formed a particularly close relationship to the boys and knew firsthand how much their parents' split affected them. Philip repeatedly wrote to them and urged them to protect William and Harry from the media storm that always stalked his family, a plea which Diana echoed throughout her life as she amassed headlines guarding her sons with paranoia fashion. But it was not always smooth sailing for Philip and Diana. Their relationship had its haze and lows, Philip wasn't always fond of how Diana presented herself to the public. The letters, however, are those of a father who wanted to ensure Diana would be able to provide for her three children and feel supported as she coped with personal demons, all in an effort at maintaining family unity. Charles was already clinging on to Camilla by his fingertips, as he struggled to hold the royal family together during a hugely fractious time. Meanwhile Philip's vouchsafe of support provided Diana with her own personal rock through some of those challenged dark times. It is beyond doubt that Philip had more than personal loyalty in mind with his efforts to help Diana, he sought also to shore up the monarchy. With his support of Lady Diana, he was hoping to keep the family intact for William. Harry and any future monarchs as well. The new letters show a man who appears to have been as well an unflappably staunch ally of Diana's during her rock-bottom moments, hard though that may be to contemplate, in light the infamous telephone row tapes between Charles and Camilla. In relation to Charles, palace sources have told of the rooted impact these revelations had on him apparently being left in tears. This, of course raises some very uncomfortable questions. That's it for our video my friends, I hope you have liked it, please let me know your thoughts in the comments, and like the video. If you haven't done so yet if you want to be first to be informed about my content, please subscribe to the channel and make sure you turn on notifications. Thank you for spending this time with me, take care of yourself and stay healthy, I'll see you in the next one.